This summer, I spent part of my time taking photographs for the WJC Front Steps Project. I have a love of photography, knew the majority of the congregation, and was beginning to feel a little cooped up. I shared my initial thoughts about this experience in a postscript to the video of the photos a few weeks ago in a synagogue mailing. I've continued to take photographs as requests have come in, but rest assured, this is not another ad for the same activity. However, in the ensuing weeks, I've had time to process my experience a little bit more. This week's Parsha, Ki Seitse, to some extent, has helped crystallize some of my thoughts. All of us know someone who said that there's always something in the Parsha that reflects on the activities of the week, past few weeks. Needless to say, this Parsha for me has arrived at just the right time. The age range of the congregants who chose to participate in the WJC project was from under 20 to over 90. Some folks dressed up, others clearly did not. Kids were in trees, upside down, in pyramids, on shoulders, and occasionally actually standing on front steps. Adults had their arms around each other while others held photos of loved family members, either geographically removed or carried in their hearts. Despite the myriad front steps per participants, there were only two categories of questions. The first, pragmatic. When do I get to see my photo? What if I don't like them? When will the community see them? How many people are involved, etc.? Very practical, now questions, and perfectly appropriate. Not at all unlike the myriad people and the myriad practical questions of the Jews in the desert at the beginning of Deuteronomy. Where do we get water? Why did we ever leave Egypt? When will Moses get off the mountain? Is it 40 days yet? Are we there yet? Just how do we cook manna? In fairness to the current WJC congregants, however, there was much more intellectual curiosity and almost no kvetching. Now remember, I said for the Front Steps project, there were two categories of current questions. The second set were community-based. How is your family? How is the fill-in-the-blank family? How's the synagogue doing? Do we think we will have high holiday services? When will the pictures be posted? I'd really like to see the so-and-so family. I have some spare time. Is there something for which I can volunteer? I have some time to cook. Is there a way I can be helpful? What made the project so much fun for me was the evidence of community. People were clearly concerned about each other, had common goals, and clearly shared common values. This was a level beyond that of the individual participant. So now back to the Parsha. How do we move the Jews from individual personal issues to collective concerns and values? It's mitzvot. And Moses was going to impart them before his death, as he clearly would not accompany his people into the land of Israel. There are 74 mitzvot in the Parsha, more than in any other. They provide multiple opportunities to move from me to we. Over the centuries, commentators have indicated the importance of these commandments in the creation of a peoplehood. Maimonides quotes one of them, you shall open your hand wide to your brother, to your poor. That requires us to treat everyone kindly, even if the other person has wronged or offended you. In our lifetime, citations of the Parsha have come from Rabbi Daniel Hartman, who contends that the question of what is right and just derives from this Parsha. Writing for the Committee of Law and Jewish Law and Standards, Rabbi Elliot Dorf relied on one of the verses in the Parsha to indicate a duty to help see that our society provides health care to those who need it. Rabbi Joseph Telushkin cites this Parsha, stating that the Torah provides long life for obeying three specific commandments, removing a mother bird before taking eggs, honoring your mother and father, and the use of honest weights in commerce. Two of these are in this Parsha. Other mitzvot, particularly worth mentioning, are to not only allow a runaway slave to remain in your midst, but to allow him to live anywhere he wants. This mitzvah clearly was neither the rule of law for neighboring lands in biblical times, nor could be found two millennia later in the US, also cited as the mitzvah of paying labors promptly. 
The Parsha ends with the story of Amalek. One of the explanations of why his name should be blotted out was that he preyed on the weak, the infirm, and those who could not protect themselves. Obviously, therefore, we are expected to protect these populations. While none of the WJC conversations in the past few weeks have involved fair weights or mother birds, they clearly did include caring for the sick and infirm, concerns for one neighbors, and an incredibly strong notion of community. There is a midrash of Moses moving forward in time and appearing in the back row of Rabbi Akiva's class. He listens for a while, and even, even though he does not understand much, he is comforted at the end when Rabbi Akiva states that these are the teachings of Moses that have been handed down from generation to generation. Had Moses moved a little bit more into the future, to modern times, I am sure he would have understood even less of what he saw. But if he had witnessed the concern for others and the notion of responsibility, he would again have been comforted. Shabbat Shalom.